Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of FedWatch. My name is Ansel Lindner. This is a Bitcoin Magazine podcast. Today we have a big episode where we are going to cover Federal Reserve news, ECB news, CPIs from Europe and the US, yield curve, and PBOC news. So there's tons to get to. If this is your first time to the show, subscribe. Um, we have a playlist on the Bitcoin Magazine YouTube channel just for this podcast. We also are available on any podcast app. What we do here is we try to look at central bank headlines, understand monetary policy, understand what they're saying, understand the position that Bitcoin, uh, sorry, central banks are in and how that's going to affect the ultimate shift to a Bitcoin standard. So I don't always talk about Bitcoin on this show, at least as much as I talk about central banks and the dollar, but just understand that Bitcoin is the future. So when people talk about Bretton Woods 3 recently, that's been all the buzz. What Bretton Woods 3 means to me is Bitcoin. That's the next system. So anyways, let's go ahead and dive in to some of our news. This is Federal Reserve calendar news. Powell is speaking tomorrow. I'm recording this on 420. So he is going to be speaking tomorrow at the University of Pennsylvania. This is just, you know, a speech circuit that he goes on, but we can expect some headlines from what he's talking about monetary policy wise. Will he be as hawkish as they have been recently? Um, we're getting some CPI data out from the United States that could be showing possibly a turnaround in the CPI. It, well, we'll cover that when we get there. Uh, the next big thing on the agenda for the Fed is May 3rd and 4th is the big long-awaited FOMC meeting. So all they've done so far in this cycle of raising rates and hawkish talk that they've been doing recently, the last six months, uh, they've only raised rates once up to a new range of 0.25 to 0.5. So they haven't, they've talked a lot, but they haven't really done much. And this is going to be the first meeting where they possibly could raise rates up to 50 basis points. Now there has been Bullard. He's the president of the St. Louis Fed. He's come out recently and talked about a 75 basis point rise, as well as getting to 3.75% on Fed funds by the end of the year. Now that is just crazy. It's way out of bounds. I, I will go on record saying that's not going to happen. And he knows much better than I do that that's not possible to get to 3.75 by the end of the year. Now, so then why would he be calling for that, right? Why would he be asking to get to 3.75? Well, because he wants to form the expectation that it could get that high. That is the Fed's monetary policy, which I've covered many times on this show. The Fed's monetary policy is not QE. QE is not money printing. You know, the, what they do, for the most part, is expectation management. If they can, they think the mechanism of monetary policy is if they can get the market to expect inflation, they will act inflationary and they will manifest that inflation in the future. If they want to put a pause on inflation, then they will signal hawkishness, get people to you know, think there's going to be a pullback in inflation in the future and people will manifest that. So if, you know, just think right now, everybody thinks inflation is here to stay. Everybody thinks inflation is going up. So the Fed has to be extremely hawkish to get people to change their inflation expectations. So it's no wonder why they're talking this hawkishly. You know, this is the highest inflation or CPI print. And I, I try to be very careful on my terminology because it is not inflation. It is consumer price index, not consumer price inflation. So this is just a... Um, index of consumer prices and consumer prices can go up and down for many reasons inflation being just one of them so i try to be very 
precise or careful on my language. But sometimes I do say inflation when I mean CPI. Okay, but uh, inflation is money printing. Don't get that mixed up with consumer prices. Anyway, so um, yeah, that's that's their main monetary policy tool is forward guidance, and that's why they're getting so hawkish. They wait until the economy really turns over and we get a big dip into recession when people will start moving their expectations down for inflation you know then they will ease up on their hawkish sentiment so the more you hear policy error the more people buy into what they're doing and th that means the more successful their monetary policy is again it goes back to uh, paul krugman he's a nobel prize winning economist uh, kind of a clown now but he said it back in 98 talking about the japanese situation that they the reason why they're stuck in depression is because they weren't credibly irresponsible they needed to talk bigger go big or go home with the qe money printing of course it didn't work they did go big they went qe and qqe and much more debt to gdp than we can imagine over here in the united states and they still don't have the inflation that they wanted right so it didn't really work and paul krugman would tell them well you weren't credibly irresponsible you need to be bigger to make people believe that you're making a mistake you're being so irresponsible that you're making a mistake and we're going to get massive inflation then you change their expectations for inflation which make them act or behave in an inflationary manner as if there is high inflation and that will manifest itself in inflation see how messed up it is it's, it's hard to get in the heads of these central bankers but that's how they think all right anyway i talked a little bit about cpi possibly turning over and so i wanted to bring up a few charts here go through this let's uh screen share i can do this all right here we go so this is the consumer price index in the united states and of course you see the most recent reading that has come out since the last fed watch episode our, our very last episode was an interview with matthew pines and he's the author of bitcoin and the u.s national security or u.s national strategic interests uh, it's a very good interview and so i recommend going back and listening to that but then we had two weeks off for the conference in Miami, and I'm just getting back into the swing of it here, giving you an update on what's going on central bank-wise. But in that interim, they did come out with a CPI print of 8.5, 8.5, and people are losing their minds. <laughs> but you got to remember, this is a year-on-year -year change. This is not cumulative. So last month, when in March, the March reading of 7.9, followed on by this reading of 8.5 that doesn't mean it's cumulative like every month we're getting eight percent inflation it means that compared to last march prices have increased by eight percent and what has happened in that time well supply chain issues right uh war all, all sorts of things have happened since 2021, March of 2021, that can make an 8% increase in prices. I mean, 8%, it's not that much. Or if, if there were a late freeze or an early freeze, whichever one would affect the orange <laughs> harvest, but if there, there was a problem, if there was a freeze that affected the orange harvest and the price of orange juice rose by 25 to 50%, we wouldn't say, that that is because of inflation that's not an inflationary price hike but when a similar natural event causes oil to rise which oil affects all other prices right oil because it costs to transport oil is in the transport oil is in the creation oil is in the maintenance oil is in the uh, intermediate products it's in the cost of your gasoline to get to the store to buy the goods in the first place. So oil is in everything. And if oil, if there's some natural disaster that happens and oil goes up, it's going to affect all of the prices. And it, it, it is not out of a normal 
shift to say, well, prices could go up 8%. If oil doubled in a matter of a year and all other prices went up by 8%, that's not out of the realm of possibility. So if this is year on year, let's just go back here to March of 2021 to get an understanding of this. So back then the CPI was at 2.6%. Sorry. 2.6%. And if uh you know the prices back then compared to today, that is the 8% difference. Now what happened in April? Of 2021 we had an acceleration big time acceleration upwards in the cpi to 4.1 so from 2.6 to 4.1 that was the biggest acceleration then may it also went up almost to 5 4.94 so big acceleration in april and may and back months ago i don't remember if it was december or january um, we got a discussion on the show here about when we could see cpi turnover and start coming down and i said well look cpi took off in april and may of 2021 so most likely april and may this year we'll start to see a decrease because year over year we're talking about year over year prices so pretty much if if the rate of change is less between this march and this april than last march and last april we'll see a decrease in the cpi and it can move pretty quickly. Uh, the CPI can crash pretty quickly. But th anyway, that's that's. Um, I'm not calling for a crash of CPI, but I do think we're going to see some uh, flattening out and perhaps a turn back down in the CPI. So that is, uh, we we see some signs of this already, like the month on month numbers. So not only the year over year, they have a month on month change. And in the core CPI that doesn't include these volatile parts like food and energy, which of yes are very, very important, but they are volatile due to natural causes, natural reasons that aren't money printing. So if we're trying to talk about inflation here, it take out food and energy, the core CPI slowed down dramatically in March down to 0.3% month on month. I think from 0.8 to 0.3. And we could see an actual decrease in the core CPI, maybe a negative print. And if that's the case, we could see a negative shift in the CPI trajectory lower. Now that's what we're talking about transitory. Transitory is a term that got, has been laughed at now, but really it's been a year, right? Since April of 2021, when CPI really took off, how fast do you want transitory to be? I think under two years would be a decent time. We're talking about massive disruptions from COVID reopening and now Ukraine and all, another COVID outbreak over there in China. So you have these massive disruptions in the global economy and the sanctions. It's not the war, it's the sanctions that matter over there in Ukraine. But I, I mean, how transitory do you want this to be? It's going to take years, maybe two or three years to have go through the cycle. That's what transitory means. Not what people think is, oh, is a two month bump. No, it's it, basically Powell was saying by transitory is that it's not a big change in trend. It's just a temporary change and it will be back on trend and trend is down there at two, one to 2% inflation. Anyway, I think I beat that dead horse. Let's take another, let's take a look at another chart here. This is the University of Michigan inflation expectations. Of course, this is consumer prices expectations, not necessarily inflation, um, but it's really stuck under 5% here. So it's been 4.9 for the last two months. And since they started really talking hawkish at the end of last year, it's uh, really slowed and flatlined just under 5%. Of course, during the great financial crisis, it did get over 5% for several months. So it has not gotten that high this time. And it, this is a result of job owning, right? What the Fed is saying that they're trying to really push down on inflation, that's going to affect uh, consumer 
inflation expectations. So this does look also like it's flattening and possibly turning over. Let's take a look at another story here out of the Federal Reserve. This is a press release from April 11th, 2022, and it's titled Inflation Expectations Decline in the Medium Term Increase in the Short Term. So the median, this is a result of a survey from the Fed, the New York Fed, the median one year ahead inflation expectations increased from 6% to 6.6 .6 in February. So February did have an increase in the one year inflation expectations. But then when they pull that out to the three year, the three year ahead inflation expectations, it decreased from 3.8 down to 3.7. So we're starting to see some of these inflation expectations flat, flatline or turn over. Many different measures are flatlining or decreasing. Let's take a look at the bond market. So the bond market, the most, the largest, most liquid market in the world, the US Treasury market, this is where these numbers come from. The five-year break-even is the uh, five-year constant maturity versus the five-year inflation protected security. So these are market rates. These are not like the Fed funds rate that is pegged at a certain range. This is a market rate. And it stands for the average, like the expected average inflation over the next five years, the five-year break-even. And what do we have? It's at 3.3% in the latest reading, 3.3%. Now that is above historical norms, I would say, over the last 15 to 20 years. I would say 2% would be the historical norm, but 3.3 is a long way from 8% CPI, right? So... Again, this is just showing that this, these numbers, 8% is probably not gonna stick. It's probably gonna come down towards this number on the five-year break-even. The 10-year break-even is even more in line with historical norms. So the latest reading is 2.9, and that is, I would say, on average of the last 15 years on this chart, we can go between two and 2.5 is the average and this is at 2.9. So that's more in line with historical averages and also showing that even the 10-year average inflation going forward 10 years, the largest, most sophisticated market in the world is not seeing the inflation. It's not seeing the growth in inflation expectations. What about the five-year, five-year forward? Now, this is the granddaddy kind of of the inflation expectation measure. It's a formula where they uh, look at the period five years out to 10 years out. So not the nearest five years, but the second five years from today. And it is below the historical averages at 2.48. Again, on this chart, I have it pulled out for 15, 20 years, and it looks like the average about 2.5. Um, it has been lower since 2014, but it is still at 2.48, so it's not at all above historical averages on this five year, five year forward. So again, the largest, most sophisticated market in the world is not seeing the long-term inflation. All right, so that's what I have for the CPI and inflation expectations. Let's real quickly into a, the yield curve. I talked about this on a recent show as well. If you go back probably five weeks, you'll find me uh, another show like this where I'm talking by myself. They, uh, uh, where I don't have CK or a guest on a guest interview, I'm talking about the yield curve. And so I wanted to update that today. And you can see over here on the left-hand side of the screen, the yield curve is very, very flat. Uh, from two years out to 30, it's very, very flat. And there is an inversion here between the seven and the 10 year. It's only one basis point, but there's still an inversion. Um, a couple weeks ago, they had a there was a major inversion. Uh, the textbook yield curve inversion is between the two and the 10 year. So when the two year rate is above the 10 year rate, that is a backward sloping curve and that means it's inverted. That happened very briefly a couple weeks ago. Um, since then that has mitigated, that specific two and 10 has mitigated, but there is still that inversion between the seven and the 10 and also the 20 and the 30. So there's two inversions on this curve. 
Now, also, how do we interpret this? So from the five year out to the 30 year rate, there is what? 13 basis points, extremely flat. And from the two year out to the 30, it's only 45 basis points. Again, extremely flat. Now that tells me, that should tell the viewer of this yield curve is that the bond market is expecting a future of low growth and low inflation. They do, not, they do not see a future of high growth, high inflation. If they did, it would be a steep curve. Especially at the back end, it would be much, much steeper. Now, why is the front end steep? Well, that is affected by Fed expectations. So what people expect the Fed to do in the near term. So it tries to, you know, almost price in what they, what they think the Fed is going to do. That left-hand side of the curve is short. The short side is much more affected by the Fed and the long-term side is affected by inflation and growth expectations. Okay. So I think that is enough, but about the yield curve and about CPI and everything, let's go in and do an update on the ECB. This is a story out of Europe, obviously, the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde, who, by the way, is a felon or she's been convicted of financial fraud, yet they thought she should be head of the ECB. Um, the ECB confirms the end of its bond buying in the third quarter as inflation surges. The ECB confirmed Thursday it will, it will conclude its net asset purchases, or QE, uh, in the third quarter. The central bank faces a dilemma with inflation hitting a record high of 7.5% in March, while the economic growth outlook weakens due to the war in Ukraine. So yes, they're, fe they're facing lots and lots of issues here in Europe. Not only quote unquote inflation or consumer prices are taking off, they have a credit crisis. They also have an energy crisis with uh, the sanctions on Russia. They have a demographic crisis. They have a food crisis in probably eastern parts of Europe, in some parts. Of, that's going to affect Europe much more than it's going to affect the United States. Um, and they're still printing money or quote unquote printing money. They're still doing stimulus. So they are in a much bigger dilemma than the Fed is in right now. The Fed had played this the best out of any central bank, in my opinion. But the Europe is in deep, deep trouble. So that doesn't make any sense with the, if they're still doing QE and they have all these energy crises going on, how is their inflation rate, which we're supposed to say is inflation, the CPI is at 7.5, where the US is at 8.5. Let's, well, maybe the Fed has printed more money. Let's take a look at that. Here is a chart of the central bank balance sheets. The blue line is the ECB, red line is the Fed, and green line is uh, the BOJ. As you can see, the blue line is higher than the red line. In this crisis, they have done more for their economy. They have printed more than the US has. And they're still in QE, yet their inflation rate is lower and yeah okay maybe the u.s is in exporting inflation well where's that ending up it's not ending up in europe they're doing more stimulus and they're still doing it yet their inflation rate is lower that that doesn't show me that there's any causal effect right it says the exact opposite actually all right another way that europe is screwed here is their Ger the german business confidence index and after the big crash in 2020, it did rebound to roughly par, and now it's crashing again off, of the off a cliff in March. Of course, driven by probably this war in Ukraine, but this is a major acceleration to the downside. So all of these things added together makes me think, right, that, that the euro is in trouble. Let's take a look at the euro here. The euro versus the US dollar. I wanted to go show a monthly, monthly uh, chart here, 
but this goes back the euro hasn't been around very long um i actually remember when it started being used in transactions i believe that was in the year 2000 or maybe it was 99 so it wasn't that long ago and that was roughly the bottom and since then it's formed kind of this uh, trend line here in red if you're watching the video that has supported the value of the euro throughout the years um, and now it has just broken down out of that long-term trend line if we go to a daily you can see that that it bounced off the long-term trend line broke it back tested and now accelerated again to the downside so the euro is looking very very weak here um, and what happens to bitcoin and what happens to the dollar when the euro is having a crisis well bitcoin should strengthen and so should the dollar so it, instead a counter to what most narratives in the macro space are out there when they try to spread this fear about the dollar is going away people are de-dollarizing all this stuff that's the opposite of what's actually happening okay people are de-euroizing right now they're getting out of the euro and they're fleeing to the dollar let's take a look at the dxy this is the dollar index versus major currencies and again this is the daily and you can see from back here in may of 2021 to today it's been pretty much straight up and we're at levels we just touched levels um this last week yesterday as i'm recording this um uh, that we haven't seen since march of 2020 and before that march of 2020 all the way back in 2017 we haven't seen the dxy this strong relative to other major currencies so the euro's having trouble people will flee to the dollar all right um what else I, I could take a look at all sorts of macro stuff if you guys want me to take a look at charts in future fed watch episodes let me know um but i do look at some macro stuff on my newsletter if you go to bitcoinandmarkets.com you can find my weekly newsletter i have price analysis for bitcoin as well as other macro analysis but real quick let's touch on bitcoin so we see this um kind of support channel that i have drawn in here uh, we bounced really nicely once we entered that channel bounced up to the top and we made new highs in this kind of bear flag uh, or formation down here at the bottom that that we were trying to bounce off of today we really did push up to about 42,100 and have since corrected if we take a look at some of the nearer time frames to me what's important is this solid break of this previous resistance so that's good I, I expect Bitcoin to benefit from a falling euro and a rising dollar the future is a competition between the dollar and Bitcoin that's why I'm not surprised to see a rise of stable coins because stable coins most of them are dollars and digital dollars will be very uh, useful and they will gain in importance in the meantime until Bitcoin can grow to take on the dollar so the end the end uh, competition is dollar versus Bitcoin not like Bitcoin versus the yuan or Bitcoin versus the ruble or anything like that no it's Bitcoin versus the dollar and that showdown is coming it'll be here faster than we think but like watching a kettle boil you know what, what's the saying a, a watched kettle never boils or something like that like it's gonna seem long since we're in Bitcoin and we're paying attention to it but for most people five ten years down the road will go by like that and we'll be seeing Bitcoin really threaten the US dollar for dominance okay what do I have coming up next I have some other charts here um, I don't I'm not going to talk about that let's go into the China stuff so uh, this is from FX Street and I'll just read this the uh, PBOC cut their re required reserve ratio by 25 basis points the People's Bank of China announced on Friday April 15th that it will lower banks required reserve requirement ratio by 25 basis points effective from 25 April now what is the RRR 
people that know fractional reserve banking will understand that as you lower the amount of reserves that you need to have in the bank relative to your lending, your loan portfolio, you can make more loans. So if I had to back my loans by 10%, say, or uh, yeah, 10% reserves, and then it, that decreases to 5%, I can make more loans, right? I can expand credit. That's actual credit expansion. So what the PBOC is trying to do is lower that requ the reserve requirement so that the banks can go out and lend. They've done this previously. Let's continue reading. The quantum of RRR is much smaller than previous rounds, which would typically be 50 to 100 basis points. Furthermore, the PBOC left its one-year medium-term lending facility unchanged at 2.85% against market's expectations of a 10, uh, 10 basis point cut. First, this could imply that the PBOC is running into cons a constraint to use the RRR as a monetary policy tool after successive reductions over the years. So they constantly were lower. This, this seems to be a translation, so I'm having trouble reading it word for word. But um, the, they've used the RRR multiple times in the last couple years, and the banks are not lending. And there is very little demand to borrow as well. Remember, they're in a real estate crisis right now. I've seen uh, numbers out of some cities where the real estate market has dropped 75%. Now, that's not over the entire country. That's just some markets. But many markets are down 20 30%. And when you have your population, 70% of household wealth is real estate and you have a real estate crisis you're gonna have major problems now they're locking down shanghai they're the the lockdowns are spreading to actual manufacturers. so shanghai is their main financial hub and then there that's extent these lockdowns are being pushed down to uh, some of their manufacturing places that are are having outbreaks of omicron that you can't stop so there's going to be supply chain issues as well. So China is looking very bad. They're not, they're not in a position to backstop the global economy if we slide into recession. They're not in position to backstop Russia either. So a lot of people think, oh, Russia can just sell their oil to China. Well, Chinese demand has fallen in the first quarter, year over year, for the first quarter. Demand for coal dropped 40%. So all of this energy demand in a recession goes down. That's why I think even with the, even if all of Russian oil goes off the market, all 5 million barrels a day, the recession will destroy demand even more than that. So the demand, total demand might fall 10 million barrels. It'll still be supply will still outstrip demand. That's why I'm predicting a fall in oil prices. A continuation of the trend that's been in place for the last 12 years. Maybe I need to flesh that out. So the last 12 years after the great financial crisis, we've been in a one long recession. And yes, the numbers you know, we can look at different GDP metrics. I mean, GDP is a flawed metric. But if we look at that, it hasn't been a consistent recession. But globally, it's been like a rotating recession around the globe since 2012. Or sorry, 2008. And since then, we had a peak in the oil price. And it's been trending down. I could actually show that chart. Let's pull up the oil price. Um, I'll do the, the futures product. And I'll go to monthly. So I have this drawn in here. This channel, this downward channel in oil prices. Because demand is falling. Even though technology like fracking and other things are accelerating oil production. The demand is not keeping up with that. And so we have a general downward trending channel. 
Now, if we include this last spike in prices, it's still downward trending, right? That might even look better, fit a little bit better. But however you make this, the oil demand is falling faster than supply. And I expect that to continue. So this, I called this on the day of the top, this oil spike, that this was a crowded trade and it's probably closer to the top, <laughs> pretty close to the top. And that was, that was the day of the top. Anyway, so getting back to China. China doesn't have the ability to add enough demand to keep prices where they are. Prices will fall. And as prices fall, you know, year on year change, it's going to affect CPI. So that gets back to the CPI. And all of this doesn't really depend on what the Fed is doing. The Fed is stumbling into being correct here. That's what I think. So looking forward in the future, uh, just to wrap this show up, guys, in the forward, uh, looking in the next couple months here, looking out over the next couple months, I expect commodity prices to cool. I expect CPI to cool off, especially in the United States, possibly not in Europe because they're doing their best to ruin their economy and the euro is falling. So um, I expect the euro to continue to fall, Bitcoin and the dollar to get bid. So, all right, that's going to do it for me, guys. Thanks for listening. Again, Ansel Lindner with FedWatch. This is a Bitcoin Magazine podcast. Check out my other podcast, Bitcoin and Markets. I do something similar here, but it's a little bit more Bitcoin oriented. I do things on that other podcast like Bitcoin Game Theory, um, you know, deeper dives into dissecting ex economics of Bitcoin itself instead of looking at the uh, Federal Reserve and looking at these monetary policy things going on. But check out BitcoinandMarkets.com where I have a free weekly newsletter. It comes out every Friday. Um, pretty popular and yeah, people like it. All right. Thanks for coming by this week. Check us next week. Hopefully we'll do a live stream on Tuesday, every Tuesday with Bitcoin Magazine, sub subject to change. But thanks, guys. Next time. See you.